Welcome to the Newfangled Workshop Podcast. Before we get into it, let's hear a little disclaimer. The views expressed here are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of the United States Military Academy, the United States Army, or the Department of Defense. So uh, welcome, viewers, listeners. Uh, this is the Newfangled Workshop uh, podcast, video cast. Um, I have Matt and Led with me here. Um, the real uh, problem we, we see is in our workshop, we create a lot of debris. So we're going to talking about real core content and creating debris along the way. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, we're going to be talking about making things, uh, makers, maker spaces, things like that. Um, we really enjoy doing that, all of us, and we're hoping to share our joy with you so that you can get enthusiastic about the projects we're into and, and the techniques and tools uh, surrounding them. Uh, let's see. We're, our goal is to make an episode about every uh, three weeks, and each episode should be about 30 minutes. Um, each episode will be hosted by a different brother, uh, and each each episode... Uh, the host will determine the format. Uh, tonight's format is um, uh, share something interesting from the internet. So um, what we've asked each uh, host to do tonight is to go out to the internet, find a very interesting project, and uh, and share it with uh, the community here, with the listeners, viewers. Uh, let's see. So before we get into the, the content, I want to do quick introductions of our hosts. So I'm Steven, and uh, let's see, some things about me. I have a wonderful wife. I have three awesome kids. Um, let's see, we have a dog, and we live in Chantilly, Virginia, near Dulles Airport, if you know that. Uh, I enjoy making stuff. Uh, I run a regional cycle cart uh, club in uh, the D.C. area, uh, and I also enjoy going to my maker space where I'm a CNC stored, and that's just a one of the volunteers that helps take care of the CNC space at our uh, community maker space. And I'm going to hand off to Led, and Led's going to tell you a little bit about his background. So, hi, I'm Led. I'm a professor and a nano farmer. Uh, I guess nano farmer means either a really, really tiny farmer or a really, really tiny farm. Um, I'm going to go with number two, really, really tiny farm, making maple syrup, sometimes honey, um, and uh, and often eggs and very occasionally chicken. Um, that's that's only when there's some incident of some kind. So I really hope that uh, the bears aren't literally eating my chickens right now as we're recording. Uh, but if they are, I'll invent something to try to win the next bear versus chicken battle. Um, and that's what motivates me as a maker. Matt? Awesome. Um, I'm Matt. I'm in Minnesota. Have a lovely wife, Trish, who is uh, exceptionally supportive of all of my endeavors. When I get a crazy idea to let's go build something to solve a problem, uh, she's very encouraging and enthusiastic. Uh, we have a flat coat retriever is our current dog, and Jovi is awesome. I'm a professor at a small university right here in southeast Minnesota. Uh, and my primary maker outlet, um, I have a shop out in the two car garage that, where I do a lot of uh, woodworking stuff. Right, so I make I like to say I make a lot of sawdust, and every so often some furniture pops out. Um, and I'm involved in the makerspace up at the university. Um, I help run that facility and uh, manage the day to day operations and what's happening in that makerspace. So I, I should interject that this is sort of a patient wives club. Uh, my wife uh, is also very tolerant of the fact that I sometimes do strange things like make a podcast with my brothers or invent things to keep bears off my chickens. So, uh, so I thought I would throw that into the mix. <laughs> Great. Thanks, guys. Um, uh, one side note, we come from a large family. So... Uh, we come from a family with eight brothers and sisters, a uh, stepbrother and a stepsister, and um, mainly in the originally in the D.C. metro area, but now we're kind of uh, global where the family lives. So uh, a little bit of our experience comes from um, that background. Yeah, and once once people catch on to this podcast, we'll be intergalactic, not just global. Yeah, as so you as you can tell from Led's background. 
with eight brothers and sisters, we should get eight views. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm we're counting maybe on it. I'm counting on it. <laughs> wait, wait. I have to go back and watch this content myself? Oh, boy. Yeah, perfect. If all the brothers and sisters and all the cousins watch it, we'll be at like 50 views. That's going to be perfect. Perfect. Um, so the, the next step was going to go uh, highlight our different projects. I was going to go first and then uh, go to Led and then uh, go to Matt. So... Uh, I'm going to share out my screen and talk about a little project that I was, I found uh, interesting. So here's my screen. These are our show notes. Yay. <laughs> this is an Instagram post I ran across. And this is actually uh, out of my brother Matt's lab, where he and his team uh, built plexiglass signs with uh, neon tube looking uh, LED strips. Right. So I call them uh, neon LEDs. Um, you can uh, buy most of these components from some somewhere like Amazon or um, uh, an electronic store that has LED strips, something like that. Uh, you can go into your workshop and you can uh, cut the channels or use a variety of techniques to actually uh, form uh, images, uh, words, uh, characters, uh, shapes uh, for the sign. Just like if you go to, I don't know. Um, someone that sells lottery tickets, like you know, have the neon signs out front, right? Or um, uh, maybe a smoky bar with a, a beer signs, right? So you can just let your creativity go wild. But, uh, you know, it's not just about um, building a sign, but it's about, um, you know, the tools and techniques that go into it. So um, what I found was, uh, okay, I, I built a couple signs myself, and then I wanted to create a course for folks to uh, build those signs as well. Um, when I did that, I found that developing a course was a, a pretty challenging because to go from soup to nuts for like this sign that you're looking at here, it might take, oh, I don't know, five hours, right, to, to build this sign. And then what techniques you're going to use, what specific components you're going to use, what color... You know, are you going to use sequencers? Are you going to use single color LED, multicolor RGB, programmable? Are you going to put an ESP32 on it so that you can Wi-Fi control the LEDs? You know, all like that. So you can see where the scope really um, can grow. And so this is a cool project I, I saw and I uh, uh, wanted to share it with you guys. Uh, what do you guys think? I, I think scoping's the king, you know, yeah. if... I, even when I'm making a project myself and like the scope only involves one laborer, namely myself, if I give myself too broad a scope with the project, it can take me months to do a project that might have been pretty darn good in a week. And in a month, you know, it's like 5% better. And in two months, it's 7% better. So I think sometimes, you know, limiting yourself like, okay, this is the colors I'm going to use. I'm going to use this piece of plastic. I'm going to use this controller, whatever. Um I, to me, to me, limiting limiting my own scope is important. I have a bathroom project currently un, incomplete because I have expanded my own scope like five times. Oh, if you're going to take the vanity out, you might as well patch the drywall, right? And if you're going to patch the drywall, you might as well take it out and put in the GFI outlet that you thought you wanted to put in, right? Like it's easy to add things to the project as you're moving through it, right? And and why not some wainscoting? Uh, you know, you should definitely do wainscoting and then, you know, and that tile that just can't stay. It's got to go. Right. So, yeah, so scope is scope creep is big. And for students, for people who are new in the new into making and maker spaces for students, it can be super frustrating if they're given too many choices. Um, I, one of the things that Steve, Stephen talked about was the, the scope thing. I find that in the entrepreneurship world, we talk about these things like minimal viable prototype or a minimal vi minimum vi viable product. And so it's what's the simplest, easiest thing that I can put together that will hit the requirements without overcomplicating it. Don't try to build the perfect thing. Build the thing that will demonstrate what you want to build in the next version, right? So if you start thinking about version zero, Right, version zero could be much easier as long as in your head you're telling yourself you're going to build version one and version two to make it better as you go. Right, an iterative process, um, and that's hard when you're doing something like a bathroom that Led was just talking about because like you're only going to do that project the one time. So 
But hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. But with the LED light signs, um, like we started very specifically with just single color. Stephen talked about how kinds of programmable wireability, plugging it into a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino so that I can control it much more dynamically and put in programmed sequences. Uh, we very specifically went with single color, two wire um, rope light that we could cut and solder. Um, the RGB stuff is amazing. But when you try to solder those four pins that are all right next to each other on that rope light, it's very careful operation, which requires somebody who's made four or five of the signs, and they're better with the soldering iron. Taking somebody who's walking in and saying, oh, I've entered the makerspace and I've never made anything before. I'd like to do an LED light project. If I put the four wire RGB in front of them, their chances of success are much smaller with the amount of soldering that we're doing. And then there's also like the level of professionalism. I'm not shrink wrapping the connections, right? Like I'm not hot gluing the connections or um, crazy gluing the connections, right? So they're not bulletproof and they're not, you know, production I would sell in a shop somewhere, but they are DIY. We've done pretty good um, and they're viable, right? So the minim minimally viable thing I think is super useful. Yeah, and Matt, just a, a pro tip on that. I shifted to the solderless connectors. So they have some snap-on alligator teeth style connectors for these LEDs, uh, both in the two-wire and the four-wire uh, format. And those worked out really well for uh, beginners. Uh, and to the, the point about the scope, um, I've got a guy uh, that I work with at the lab. Uh, his name's George, and he's a, a master with the lathe, right, with a metal lathe. Uh, and every time we talk about doing a project, he's like, where's your drawing? Right. And I found that a drawing is a great way to control the scope of your project. Cause you you've actually thought through the process. You've drawn out the component pieces, maybe the order of operations of what you're doing. Um, and even maybe the list of materials so you can go get those. Um, so you don't have to make the three trips to Lowe's to get the uh, plumbing fixtures. Right. So, it's SketchUp. Anyhow, SketchUp can be huge for that. You know, or yeah. basically any CAD program you like, but SketchUp's got a very low cost of entry. Um, but at any rate, whichever whichever package you're using, I think doing a drawing um, saves you many, many hours. Because, well, it might be frustrating to draw exactly the thing you want inside of that AutoCAD package. Um, if you can't draw it, maybe that's pointing to difficulties with making it. Yep. Hundred mm, percent. There's an organic process to being in the shop, and um, I'm a big fan of this thing called relative dimensioning, which is I've built these two parts, and then I need the part to go between them. And instead of having a picture that I'm working from, I just take the tape measure and I measure how big I need the new thing to be. There, there's an organic to the craft that, yes, you can structure and engineer it, but there's also an art element to dynamically changing. The other thing I would say about that is that that nature of being the expert or feeling comfortable making on the fly design decisions, um, that's hard to translate to a student. So when Stephen was talking about, hey, this was putting together a course for somebody else to learn from my techniques, I can no longer count on my sense of mastery of the thing, right? I have to be starting with the assumption that I have to have a detailed set of instructions that a newbie can use instead of the professional craftsman coming into the space. Yeah. And I think drawings are a great way, though, of communicating clearly. 100%. Yep. Well, good. I think this is a good start on this topic. Uh, I, I think we should shift to lead. I'm going to stop sharing. And okay. uh, lead, if you could, uh, you know, share with us your uh, your internet find, your uh, cool gadget. Okay. That'd be great. So let's see if I can screen share here. Hold on a second. Uh and we're still getting used to the technology. This is episode one, right? And so we're still kind of new with how to share the screens and where the buttons are. Right. Um, you know, the audience needs to be a little tolerant as we lean into what it is. Can we're you see doing. what I got going on here? I see. I see a video, and there's a, a crosscut sled on a table saw doing some stuff. Can do, do you see just the video, or can you see the whole thing? No, I, Jason Hess, and I see a plaid shirt. And Yeah, got, okay, so this guy Jason Hess has been putting some videos up, and I think they're pretty cool. I'm going to go full screen so I can see it a little better here. But the the thing that, so so my, uh, so of course, I'm, I'm 
it's pretty lazy when you're too lazy to even surf the web by yourself. But anyway, so my wife sent me this uh, really cool video of a guy making a Settlers of Catan uh, super fancy board, which I think is just it, it's a real knockout when you see the end of the project. And I'll zip to that at the end here. But the thing that really impressed me was the fact that, that this particular craftsman is using a lot of sub assemblies, which are either discardable or like basically they're jigs. Right. And so his use of jigs throughout the process is it's quite a clever video. Also, it shows pretty much every step of making this super fancy project. Um, you know, by the time you get to about step 50, it becomes clear how challenging a project it was. But it was still neat to see the the steps each time. But like here, I'll show you I'll show you this part right here. I think he's trying to make a hexagonal piece. And you see, the, the thing that's cool here is not. OK, hold on. I'm trying to pause it. Okay, the thing that's cool here is not the piece that he's cutting. It's this little triangle right here that's been set into the sled that he's using on the table saw so that he can hold exactly the right angle each time, make some very precise cuts without spending a ton of time doing it. Um, and whether you're welding or gluing or cutting, all of these processes, if you've got some sort of alignment jig like this, it can really speed you up. And that's just one type of jig see if I can find the other one here. Like as another example, I had another one up here. Here we go. Here's another example. This is a pretty, pretty well-known technique, but he's using, he's using this blue tape and making a series of, he's taking a complex glue up and making it into a simple process by taking the, yeah, there you go. There's the glue going in, very precise. And you can see he's doing a hexagonal glue up in one quick go, you know, trying to, and which will make sure all of his alignments are right, et cetera. Tightens it up with that um, with that tape at the end, right? And bang, the whole thing is aligned, and that tape is what's holding that glue in place. At, at least, at least for me, proper clamping, proper clamping, and here, how do I stop sharing my screen? I'll figure this out. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, okay. It says new share up here. I'll hit that button, I guess. Okay, yeah, brothers, which... doing that just real quick. I wanted to throw in the project I showed earlier was out of um St. Mary's I was in red, Minnesota. That's why I'm colorblind okay. a little bit, so it had <laughs> it had black and red with black printing on it. So there's no chance I saw that. Uh, anyway, okay. sorry, Stephen. <laughs> No, but the uh, the project that I showed with the young lady with the uh, neon sign uh, came out of Matthews University, right, in his entrepreneurial yes. space. And I, while Led was giving credit to the fellow that did the Settlers of Khan thing, I thought I was thinking, hey, I didn't give credit to Matt's group who made that that sign. And uh, well done, Matt. Yeah, it was a very collaborative effort. Um, Led, a couple things on your video there where you were showing the board. Um, I hope before we finish with your turn that you'll go back and show us the finished product. Um, he was putting in some splines there. He had some very interesting jigs and fixtures uh, that he was using. The triangle piece on your crosscut sled, he actually built that as a removable piece, right? So you can see. Um, and then a lot, what a lot of people do on their crosscut sleds to be very fancy is they put in key tracks with hold downs. So very much like you'd see on a CNC table, the work hold downs are very important on those crosscut sleds so that things don't move as you're shifting the sled back and forth like this. Yeah, and I'll share, I'll share the final product there since you're asking, Matt. Um, Interesting technique. While you're pulling that up, there was also when he was spreading the glue and you were talking about the spreading of the glue, he was using a silicone uh, glue brush there because what you do is you don't have to use the acid brushes you can use a silicone brush and then peel off the hardened glue and just reuse the thing over and over again you know that's funny matt um uh my wife i just Christine, got zoom quit unexpectedly guys um i'm tracking i see you you're good you're, you're doing great brother yeah all good but well, i'll fill in for a second while you Sort huh. that okay, left. well, I guess I'm good to go. Here you can see this final time yeah. board. <laughs> good Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> no, but um, Christina has a whole set of silicon brushes for working with resin. And I've been working with resin a lot lately, just the countertop, the foam coat, glaze coat, what have you. Um, and uh, I was like, they make resin brushes? <laughs> so, yeah, yes, good tip. Good tip, Matt. Yeah, this whole it, is kind of, it is kind of true that I'm always running into stuff 
that other people have like the perfect fix for that I've been struggling with for years, whether it's, whether it's finishing with polyurethane or whether it's, you know, uh, repainting a scratch on your car, whatever it is. And then you, you talk to somebody and they're like, oh, you know, I used a number three zip tie and it took 35 seconds and I've just spent like two days struggling with it in my driveway, you know, and, and you're like, yeah, that would have been really good if I'd used that zip tie. That would have helped there, out a lot. There's like a $12 solution down at Napa Auto Parts and you didn't know anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, been, you know, you know, you got to pull this one release spring and then the whole assembly comes right out in your hand. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've been taking apart 14 bolts to get to that thing. I didn't know there was a little spring clip. Yeah. Once right. bolt number 14 come off, the, you hear the spring go. Bang. And I got to go find it on the floor, right? Like finding <laughs> it on the floor is the whole thing. So yes, lots of debris. We do make a lot of debris in the shop. Let, I thought that was a beautiful woodworking project. He was putting splines in. Um, that same technique is how a lot of people will do mitered, cornered, um, little keepsake boxes and stuff. So the the blue tape as clamp and also as guy, he keeps it perfectly aligned. He had an advantage. He had the uh, inner piece already ready to go as he was doing his glue up. So he had something to squeeze against when he wanted the cross clamp, if he had wanted the cross clamp. His, the thought that clearly went into each step of his process Yes. So, you know, he had he had not only designed the finished product, but he had designed each step in the creation of the product. And I, and I use that word design carefully, but he had designed each of those steps uh, to work in concert with wherever wherever he was in the process. I do a, I do a variety of pedestrian bridges with my students and have over the years. Some of those bridges are pretty good sized and we have to be, you know, we're often in an expeditionary setting, say a mile into the woods and the process and the steps within the process, you really don't want to be looking for that particular strap hoist or whatever, um, you know, and it's a mile back at the truck. Uh, Steven just mentioned, you know, got to make the 14 trips to Lowe's or whatever it is. Right. I think that um, I just opened a second space. So we have the retail space and a production space uh, and they're literally, you know, 20 yards apart from each other. There's a parking lot. I have to go across to get to it. Uh, and I get so annoyed going back and forth between the two spaces because I, <laughs> because I left the screwdriver. I didn't bring the popsicle sticks or I didn't bring the pipe cleaners that I need. And I'm just like, how many trips can I make in one afternoon to go fetch a thing? Cause I'm in the wrong space. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I've a taken to tool bags because of the farm, yep. you know, there's like these yep. transit times um, and I have these tool bags and uh, I actually sent you, Matthew, a particular tool that is always in my tool bag because yes. it has like all the bits and little bolts and stuff and, you know, for, for quickly doing a thing without a battery. Um, but it, it is, it's always the question, how much weight to carry with you versus how many things do you want to be able to do that you had forgotten when you left the truck you were going to have to do? Um, one of the uh, purchases that I made that a lot of people questioned initially was I spent $70 on a little garden cart so that I could drag things around campus. And everybody's like, why do you have to get a garden cart? That doesn't make any sense at all. I'm so happy. We have other departments now coming and borrowing my garden cart to go fetch their stuff from the mailroom. I have right? a teaching barge. So yeah. as I prepare for class, I have the teaching barge. And every time that I think of something I'm going to need for class, I throw it on the barge. Perfect. And that's that's the way to go. And what it does is it lowers also your cognitive load. So instead yep. of sitting there worrying about exactly what's in your pocket, um, I know that I have a standard load on the cart that I don't have to worry about. I don't have to recheck. And that cognitive space is freed up to be creative or do design work or to not, not trip over my shoelace and spill my coffee, you know, that kind of stuff. True story. Is that David right. Allen getting things done? No. <laughs> right. No. Um, but what's the, um, uh, I was watching the the glue up with the blue tape and the, the octagon. Right. And I was thinking, or was it hexagon? Um, and I was thinking, how many clamps would that take to actually do the cross clamping? And then I had this flash in my mind of every project I've seen that had a bajillion clamps on it, right? And I thought we could just do an episode of uh, glue ups with clamps, right? And do like a slideshow and just comment on. You know. uh, so, and, and clamp storage is a huge challenge for people doing that scale. Matthew of has a lot of clamps. Uh, I run out I, I, on, a <laughs> on, on a regular basis. Uh, shout out to Harbor Freight, by the way. Harbor Matthew, Freight. do you think you sometimes have more clamps in your shop than a hardware store might have in stock to sell to customers? Yes. 
yes, I I have a significant clamp collection, and there's there's the whole like tool collecting versus tool using thing, right? It's a uh... anyway. So I'm going to jump in. I think I'm going to share my screen. Good, good. You know, okay. The producer and tell the producer is telling me in my ear here. <laughs> uh, we're supposed to keep it to 30 minutes an episode, which is uh, going to be great for us. So yeah. I'm going to I'm going to share my screen here. Goals. Yeah, goals. goal. It's Life good. Goals. To, it's good to have goals. <laughs> so you should be able to see my screen now. I hope. Yes, tracking. Uh, which is excellent. So, Matthew, this is, why are you showing us a, a broken set of shelves? So this is called a bandsaw box, and it's actually called a cracked bandsaw box, and it's a very special kind of bandsaw box. And so this bandsaw box is built out of one large blank. So you actually glue up enough wood that the whole thing is solid. And then the only tool you need, other than like sandpaper and chisels and stuff, is you throw it on the band box and you follow it. Uh, bandsaw and you follow a template and so the first thing you do is cut off the back because the back needs to be solid so you take the last half inch off or the last three eighths of an inch off the back you set the back aside then you slap it on the bandsaw sideways and you cut out each one of the drawers right and then you take each one of the drawers you cut off the front and the back you set those aside. You then carve out the hollow for the space that's going to be in the drawer and then you glue it all back together Right. And so there are actually on this bandsaw box little curves for each one of these drawers. There was a curve cut with the tape, the bandsaw that then got glued back together to make the frame look continuous, even though it isn't. Right. And because the grain's all going to match up and because it was all one big block of wood, right, you're going to get continuous and it looks really, really sharp. And so this is a you talk about orders of operation and having a sequence that you know you're going to do. Like you want to make sure you cut off the back first because you don't want to cut the holes out for the back. Same thing for each one of the little drawers. You have to cut the back and the front off and then take that middle section, carve out on the bandsaw that middle C. So you're turning each one of the drawers into basically a C by taking the hollowing out of the middle. Right. And then you glue the front and the back back on and your drawer will fit right back in the slot that it came from because it's the same saw curve that did this. Um, and so I'm totally fascinated by this uh, particular piece. Uh, Stephen's right to help me attribute this. Uh, Jay Bates is the one who got me excited about this in the last uh, couple of weeks. I came across one of his videos, and he was talking about using different band saws in one of his earlier projects. Uh, the template that he used um, is just widely available on the net. I don't know who to attribute that template to. He didn't develop it. He just found the template as well and used it. Um, and then... What I'm inspired about, what this would tell me for my next big project for me, is I'd like to do this at scale. So instead of doing it as a bandsaw box, which is interesting, I want to do it as an actual dresser, right, and then construct the thing. I love the cracked nature. I love that this seems to me like something that would come right out of a, a Beauty and the Beast or a Disney. Dr. Seuss. Yeah, Dr. Seuss. One, you can almost one... see the cat in the hat trying to clean that thing up. Yes, one one cat, two cat, one thing, thing one, thing two. There's a spot somewhere. Uh, 100%. So I, I find this really inspirational in terms of like there's a technique that I haven't mastered. I would love to go fiddle with this. My strategy would be I would try to do a batched out set of seven or eight of these, right? So that when I get done, I'm like, hey, look how cool this is. And then I have a pile and I end up giving that pile away to friends and family um, as I go. It's a pretty cool, pretty cool piece. Uh, yeah, the video is kind of slick. He, he's a little long. He he gets into education mode, right? And he's teaching you how to do the thing. Um, and so it's probably not a quick little two or three minute, like here, here's the quick little show. I think it was like a 30 minute video that he walks you through each of the steps of the process. Um, but I just absolutely loved it. Th this is the kind of stuff that, you know, gets my brain fired with what can I go do out in the shop, right? My My maker is like, yes, let's go do this. How big is it? Uh, this one, I think he said it's 14 inches tall, right? So one of the things, depending on how you build it, you have to be careful with the constraints of your band saw, right? So if you have a small hobby shop, the little six inch band saw, you can only make it about six inches wide because that's the maximum you can put into your band saw. So you, the you have throat to be... of the machine. Yes. Yeah. There's a, there's yeah, a yeah. limitation like the, the planers, like most people have like a 13 inch or a 12 and a half inch planer. So gluing up a table, um, that's 36 inches wide is really hard and you have to do that in segments because of your tooling um sure. and so the tool the tooling is a whole thing mm -hmm. 
Cool. So how much how much time would you estimate it would take? Um, maybe after you made a couple of them, not the first one. The first one always takes a little longer. How much time to make something like this, do you think? Um, so there's actual work time and then there's duration from start day to end day. Cause there's a lot of glue up that goes into this. And then, sure. There's a paint, um, there's paint on there. There's paint and finish and there's a ton of sanding that's going to go into it. Um, one of the controversies in my world is a lot of the guys say, Oh, you use the yellow PVA glue, you clamp it up. And in two hours you start working with it again. And in, in my process, I don't trust it until it's been in the clamps probably eight hours, right? Like I won't, mm -hmm. I won't put something on the table saw unless it's been glue dried. The glue has had a chance to dry for about eight hours. Yeah. Um, I had, a, I had a failure recently. I was painting, I was painting windows. I, I built a set of custom windows for my new shed and each window was about 48 by, I don't know, 24, something like that. Um, and I was painting the frames and had them hanging on coat hangers from the uh, from the garage door opener rail, which probably is not like the number one paint drying thing to do. Um, and I came back in to to find one of them laying on the floor in yeah. you know four pieces because I had painted it and then hung it, and I think the glue failed or or one of my rabbit joints. You know, it wasn't a great joint. It was like a, a rabbit uh, uh, rabbit joint. Um, uh, no, sorry. It was a biscuit joint. Um, and the biscuit joint had just come apart because I was hanging it at that two hour mark, Matt. So yeah, you're probably right to do what you're saying. I just wanted to wait, wait a little longer. So Stephen, to answer your question, um, I think that if I put in a solid weekend, if I started on a Friday night, um, I could probably have it done late Sunday. I have a 48 hour duration, probably I'm going to guess eight or 10 hours of effort. Uh, during Fair. that course course of the weekend. So duration, probably about 48 hours, effort, eight to 10 hours um, of actual work going into it. And that's, you know, having not built one yet, that's my guess. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I then I would also, oh, I well, one last thing. I have a comment about glue. Okay, go ahead, Matt. Uh, my my one ahead. last thing would be um, that I also batching them out, right? So I get an efficiency. If I do the same step eight times to build eight of them, there's a huge efficiency that I can get. And maybe if I double my work effort, um, I can get probably eight times as much stuff because I'm not doing the tool setup again. I'm using the same tool setup to duplicate and make multiples of the same thing at a time. So yeah. I yeah, glue is a thing. Like, but let's like talk it. about resins. Stephen no, 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 wants to no, talk no, about no. resins. Yeah, Stephen wants to talk about glue. One point. One one point, and then we get to talk about resins. Aliphatic resin, uh, Stephen, or epoxy resins? What do you <laughs> epoxy resin is mainly mainly what I'm working with, just for fun, crafting. Everything looks better with a shiny coat of resin, by the way. Like yeah. you put resin on this little cracked uh, bandsaw box, it's going to pop, <laughs> right? Um, but I think Matt hit a, 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 a note that, that made me think. Um, PVA yellow glue, right? He just threw that out there. Like every bottle of PVA glue that you pick up can be characterized as PVA yellow glue. Yep. The fact is they're very different, right? So if I pick up type bond one, it's different than pipe type bond two, different than type type bond three. And actually the 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 key thing that Led ran into with this thing falling apart is is based on that that quick bond time of the glue. And each one is different. Right, whether you have the Gorilla Glue, whether you have Elmer's, or you know whatever woodworking glue you use, each one of them that there's somebody has a paper that I actually read that that did testing. They 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 squeezed it together, two pieces of wood together with the di twenty different brands of glue, and then did a, a pulling apart of it with fifty pounds of force to try to pull the two blocks together. And it said like, at what point? How many minutes into the business? Does it have, uh, can you not pull it apart with 50 pounds of force, right? And so uh, my, my point is you have to be careful about what kind of glue you're using uh, to get uh, repeatable results. I so usually use it... store glue. Store glue. That's, yeah, store glue is like some glue I got at the store. <laughs> no, it, you're exactly right that reading up, reading up and making sure that you're using the right, the right uh, duration of epoxy, the right amount of hardener, the right coatings. Um, I'm a huge coatings person. Um, and prepping properly for coatings, getting the right coatings on is, is super annoying and super important. Yep, 100%.
I'm I'm completely uh, tight bond. Two is the only way to go in a wood shop. Uh, like, so I'm, I have brand loyalty and I have an affinity for a particular product. Um, I go tight yeah. bond one. I do that because it it bonds in ten minutes to a 50, 50 pound pull pull yes. test. Type yes. on two takes longer. I think it takes like sixty minutes. Wait, or something like you guys that. are saying there's no gorillas holding anything together here? Now, gorilla is strong. <laughs> Have you ever met a gorilla? They're huge. Wow, I know. They put right? them right on the bottle. So, so there's all of these. As Steve is talking about the very technical aspects of it. There's this uh, potting time, shelf life. There's the uh, how soon until it's tacky. There's an open time of like how much time do I have when I pour my glue? How much time do I have to put my whole face frame together? Before don't forget like, VOCs, Matthew. VOCs are an important oh, part of our modern oh, workplace. Oh yeah. Why, why do you think I enjoy woodworking? No, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I'll, but you know what I'll do? I'll go and uh, I'll find that article I read and I'll post it in the show notes, right? Oh, when I, we uh, have it online for uh, recording, uh, this I'll sounds, put a link this, in for that. Yeah. This sounds spectacular. Uh, Stephen, I have to say, I love the format you came up with. This has been great. Like everybody got their turn and then there was some back and forth. There were some side comments. I think this is uh, a format that I'll look forward to every third episode. Awesome. No, I I loved your projects, guys. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for sharing oh. and thanks for taking the time to hang out with me this evening. Super fun. Okay, excellent. And you should, the audience should expect another episode in about three weeks, right? So we're going to put a couple of them in the can and then start publishing. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but thanks for spending some time with us. All right. Night, fellas. But no, no, don't hang up. Are you sure you want to stop recording this? 